we are set with uncertainty. Higher inflation than expected, and of course, the war in Ukraine putting doubts on economic growth and even more doubts around inflation. The Eurozone is uncertain. We are extremely honored to welcome to our stage today the Vice President of Europe's mightiest financial or economic institution. Oh, sound? Yes, perfect. <laughs> Um, and our guest has been central to the European economy for over two decades now, from overseeing Spain's entry to the Eurozone to getting Spain out of the debt crisis and even to overseeing the ECB's COVID response. Today we're going to discuss questions like what are the current financial stability risks, but also can we still expect economic growth? And if all these things come together, what will it mean for the tension in the Eurozone? So, my name is Marlene, and this is Tim, and please give a very warm applause for Luis Guindos. <laughs> Hello, good to have you here, we're very pleased. How are you doing? Thank you very much, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, I have to apologize because of my joke, uh, I used to say that my voice now looks like uh, the voice of the girl of the Exorcist film. <laughs> but I will try to do my best uh, in order to, you know, to make myself understand the voice. Yeah. We'll uh, make sure that happens. And let's make this way Hang a second, because I feel like uh, something needs to be done. <laughs> yeah, okay, I think we can go on. Yes. Um, in 2000, before 2008, you were advisor to Lehman Brothers, uh, then that collapsed. Then you were Minister of Spain's Economy and Competitiveness during the Spain's debt crisis, and now the Vice President of the ECB during the COVID crisis. Aren't you a bit tired of the word crisis? <laughs> well, you know, it's, uh, the last 20 years have been quite exciting. I don't know you can listen to me much better now. So, uh, well, you know, I, I was saying that uh, the last 20 years have been difficult, difficult times in terms of uh, different crises. We had uh, the great financial crisis, we had COVID, and now we have the invasion of Ukraine. And I think that, uh, you know, this is uh, the proof of the importance of the European institutions in this moment of time. I think if you, if you allow me to say, I think that uh, something that is quite relevant is that the response, for instance, to the COVID crisis was totally different to the response that we had in 2010, 2011, 2012 during the debt crisis. And uh, in my view, it's, it has been much better. You know, if you look at uh, uh, the evolution of fiscal policy, the implementation of monetary policy, the response that we have, uh, we have pursued over the last two years I think that gives uh, the, the impression and the reality that uh, uh, Europe is much better prepared now to deal with this kind of crisis. And then you as a person, uh, you were first uh, arguing from Spain's position, so as on a country level, and now in the European Central Bank, you have to argue as a European-wide, non-political entity. How is that different? How has that switch been? Well, you pass me the button. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it's totally, totally different. Uh, well, uh, you are minister of a, of a country, of the union, of the euro area, you have to go to the euro group, you have to go to the ECOFIN, and European matters uh, are very relevant for any, for any European country, you know. But, uh, well, the focus is different. Now, you have to look at, uh, you know, the whole euro area, in the case of the ECB. Uh, you have to forget a little bit about, uh, about uh, you know, your, let's say, uh, uh, country of origin. What do you prefer? No, I prefer the European approach. You know, there is something that is quite relevant now. You know, this, is not, this has not, nothing to do with economics, but I think that it's something that I would like to underline. Is uh, You can be Dutch, I can be Spanish, but in these times, it's especially important to be European. Take it well, because we have the invasion of Ukraine, I think that the response uh, at the European level has been quite, uh, quite, uh, quite good in terms of sanctions. Uh, I think that we are more united than we were in 2010, 2011. And I think that uh, when we are together, we are much, much stronger. This is one of the lessons that we are to, to learn. Yeah? Uh, 
from you know, this kind of crisis now. COVID was uh, you know, a shock, exogenous shock. Uh, and I, I, I said before that the response, the economic policy response was, was much better than in 2011. Uh, but now I think that the response of Europe uh, is also you know, quite, uh, quite good. You have seen that uh, while well, sanctions were, were taken, Common, 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 uh, you know, aid package was implemented and pursued for Ukraine. And I think that, uh, you know, it's very important because uh, at the end of the day, the European values are the values of uh, an open society, a liberal society, of tolerance, democratic values. And I think that this is something that uh, all of us, we have to fight for. And this is, uh, this is uh, you know, the, 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 the background of the European, the European Union. And uh, I am totally sure that we will prevail, I can assure you. Yeah. Now, you, let's talk about your job right now, how you're serving this purpose. Uh, you're a central banker, and um, a central banker never operates in certainty, but uh, in her latest speech, President Lagarde even said that the ECB now faces an eternal test of how to live without certainty, but yet without being paralyzed by hesitation. Why are these times so much more uncertain than expected? Well, first of all, uh, we had a, a, you know, a health shock that was COVID that gave rise to the biggest decline in GDP uh, in many, many, many decades. Uh, I think that, as, as I said before, that the response was good. Uh, we recovered the pre-corona uh, income level in the last quarter last year. But, uh, uh, well, uncertainty was there, you know, we have different waves of, 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 of infections and, uh, well, it was, uh, you know, an external shock that always makes uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy much more, much more, much more difficult. And now we have another shock, it's a war. Mm -hmm. We have been told only two or three years ago that in the backstage of Europe we would have uh, uh, a war, perhaps, you know, we would not believe it. Uh, so, uh, well, it's an internal, it's an internal test in terms of unity first. Unity. And afterwards, uh, you know, uncertainty is bad, you know, in terms of economic, uh, economic policy, in terms of economic performance. Economic agents want to have certainty about the future. And uh, households, investors, uh, corporates, uh, they need to have, you know, a, a horizon. Huh? Uh, with clarity in terms of the decisions that they have, they have to take. And I think that the kind of shocks that we are suffering now, you know, have created a lot of fog, let's call it that way. So, uh, in that respect, uh, I think that uh, the people responsible for economic policy has to, 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 to have to do a, a, you know, a, a, a job, job in order, order to try to, to create much, much more certainty, certainty. Uh, just to give guidance on how things can evolve over time and to deliver a little bit of confidence and credibility. Hmm? Yeah. You have to, 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 to lead a little bit, no? But I think that, uh, you know, these times are especially, especially complicated huh? for, uh, you know, the decisions that we are going to take. Because, uh, for instance, the war is going to have an important impact on the outlook, yeah. yes. both on inflation and on growth. Exactly, on the infl I think it's, yeah, it's mine is working it's again. Working. I don't know if yours is working, <laughs> but. Thank you. Uh, right now, indeed, on the inflation and on economic growth, um, to focus more on the inflation side, uh, the last few government council meetings, every time it's been said that inflation is going to be transitory and that we shouldn't put, per se, actions into play. But now, the, now since the last government council meeting, it seems like it, the actions are more, that inflation is more persistent, at least than expected. Why was the ECB so surprised? Well, uh, I think that we have had, uh, you know, an accumulation of, uh, let's say, negative surprises to respect to inflation before the war, right? they refer to before the war, and I will refer afterwards to the impact of the war. Uh, if you look at, uh, you know, the evolution of inflation, not only the ECB, but the majority of the, of the analysts, they have been underestimating inflation for a long period of time, and, uh, well, the negative surprises were there. And before the crisis, inflation in the euro area was close to 6%, before the, 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 the Ukraine uh, uh, invasion. So we had a problem with inflation in that, uh, in that moment of time. We believed, and I think that uh, there is a part, part of, of, the, the, of, of, the, of the inflation, inflation shock, shock 
that, that was, was uh, uh, you know, linked, linked to very concrete and temporary factors. But I think that the main factor behind uh, has been, you know, the evolution of energy prices. Mm -hmm. That, uh, you know, is behind, uh, you know, is, uh, it explains you know, an important part of the inflationary shock that we have suffered over the last six months. But simultaneously, I think that there are other elements that have been rise to a much more, let's say, permanent uh, trend in inflation. Yeah. And I think that the key factor here is going to be the evolution of wages and the evolution of second round effects. Yeah, because right now that is not feasible yet, but we should prepare that it might uh, exist or start to develop. Isn't inflation only going to start up now, or like, uh, are, aren't we still underestimating it? Well, I hope no. Uh, uh, well, now, for instance, yesterday we had the data, the figures of Spain and Germany, that were again negative surprises. Today we had Italy and France that uh, were above, uh, uh, you know, projections. So, and tomorrow we will have, we will have, uh, you know, the figure for, for the euro area. And, uh, you know, it's totally, you know, I would say that is, uh, is for sure that uh, we will see uh, higher inflation in comparison with February, that in March, well, the number will be, will be, will be, will be higher. Here, the question is that, uh, you know, in March, we start to feel the impact of the war in terms of energy prices and commodity prices. You have to bear in mind, if we go back to the question of the invasion of Ukraine no, and letting aside uh, how terrible it is in terms of human lives and, and the destruction that is producing, that uh, the Russian economy is not a big economy. The Russian economy is an economy with a size similar to the Spanish economy. Uh, so in terms of uh, you know, the traditional trade channels, uh, it's not going to have a big, impact, a big impact. Where the impact is going to be uh, much, more, much more relevant is going to be in the commodity markets. Russia is, uh, you know, a very important player in terms not only of energy, but as well of other raw materials and commodities in general. So there we have started to see an important increase in prices, and this is going immediately, you know, to be reflected on uh, retail prices. You know, the, the most evident one is the price at the pump. Hmm? Uh, and the price of power, for instance. Hmm? So the channel that's more most important is to per se inflation instead of economic growth. That's well, you know, on economic growth is going to have, a <laughs> let's go to economic growth afterwards. <laughs> uh, but uh, on inflation is going to be quite clear, quite, quite clear, no? And so, you know, we had an inflation that was on the rise before the, the invasion, and this is going to aggravate inflation. I think that inflation will continue uh, rising over the next, uh, over the northern months, months but we expect that inflation will start to decline hmm, in the second half of the year and uh, that the peak, uh, well, I hope that will be, will be reached uh, in three, four months. Hmm. But in the next months, we will see that inflation continues going, going, yeah. going. And do you expect up. to see this wage price spiral as that's, well then? That's the key question. That's yeah. the key quest, question. Because uh, if we start to see second round effects, then the situation can be much more complicated. You can mm -hmm. enter into a, into a sort of, let's say, wage price spiral. Yeah. And that's bad, because that will make uh, uh, inflation much more, much more permanent. Yeah. So far, I have to say, we have not seen much hmm, in terms of uh, wage increases. But uh, inflation is very high. But isn't it in inevitable to see such a spiral at some point? Because inflation right now Wages will stay will for at least two Wages years. Will in increase. But I think that what is very important is to bear in mind that you have you know, a temporary spike in inflation. Hmm. So if you incorporate this uh, inflation spike to uh, nominal incomes, let's call it wages, pensions, rents, whatever, then you are, doing, you are making uh, the, 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 inflation, uh, the inflation shock much more permanent. And this is something that we have to look at very carefully because the response in terms of monetary policy is different. So far, we have not seen much wage increases. Hmm? Hmm. But, uh, well, uh, for instance, you know, one, one issue that we will have to monitor very closely is the possibility that in the wage bargaining process, you start to have indexation clauses yeah. coming back to the, to, the, to, the, to the negotiation. 
to the to the to the to the settlement. Yeah. Well, these kind of things are the ones that we have to, to look at uh, very carefully because they are going to determine the future the future stance of monetary policy. Yeah. Okay, let's look at something else too. Uh, we also have seen the housing market rapidly heating up in different markets in the eurozone, and the housing market is one of the key indicators for financial stability. Especially here in the Netherlands, we saw a rise of 20% yeah, sure. in December. Um, yeah, how exposed are we to the risk of? Uh well, we are we are we are exposed. There are some you know concrete uh, concrete uh, you know uh, spots in the real estate market that uh, you know are you know prices uh, you know are uh, you know very 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 high. You know, and I think that uh, Netherlands and Amsterdam is one of these uh, you know situations, concrete situations. No, no, I think that uh, you know this is something that we are continuously considering. We are looking at. Uh, is one of the main financial stability risks, because if you enter into the territory of a bubble, we are not there so far. You know. So we're not at the bubble yet. Well, it depends on the on the you know the concrete uh, the concrete location that you are looking at, but we are not. I think that uh, you know overall we are not in a bubble. We are hmm, in a situation that you have concrete spots where prices are are extremely extremely high. No, but I think that uh, the way to respond to that is not monetary policy. Is much more macroprudential policy. But do you think, to some extent, that the monetary policy of the past years, that was very loose, has accommodated the rises in prices? Well, but uh, you know, we, we 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 are continuously analyzing, you know, the impact in terms of financial stability of our monetary policy decisions. But the point is that you know, and this is not only for monetary policy, for any economic policy decision that you take, you have to continuously compare the pros and the cons. Yeah. So, uh, you know, our loose monetary policy had to do with, uh, you know, the pandemic and it has made, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, this crisis uh, was not even, uh, you know, bigger than the one that we had at the beginning in 2020. So, uh, we know perfectly that there are side effects, hmm? but, uh, you know, the core effects that we are looking for clearly outweigh the side effects one of the side effects is the evolution of uh, prices in the real estate. Yeah. So you have to be a little bit more specific. You have to go and to try to address, you know, these situations with macroprudential policies. For instance, you know, raising the, the capital buffer of the banks with borrower-based measures, uh, trying to limit very concrete because uh, monetary policy is not an instrument to deal with very concrete, very specific, very chirurgical uh, and concrete and specific situations, you know, in, in some countries. Yeah. And that's what, for instance, you know, the, the, here in Netherlands, uh, the, bank, the central bank is taking measures in that respect. Yeah. And one final question on this housing market, because you say we're not in a bubble yet, uh, and we all would like to know that because uh, we all don't have a house, house yet. Um, but currently we have high inflation, we have threats to economic growth, and we have the prospect of tightening monetary policy at some point in the near future. So, in my opinion, it seems to be quite inevitable that we get some kind of correction in the housing market. Well, perhaps, you know, we will have, I would not say tightening, I would say normalization of monetary policy. Yeah. For instance, you know, we have, uh, we have elimi el eliminated, eliminated our, our pandemic uh, program, what we call the PPP. Now it's over at the end of, uh, of March. And, uh, well, we have started to say that we, have, we are going to reduce, uh, you know, the pace of purchases because taking into consideration, you know, financial well, price stability, the price stability situation, and financial uh, financial costs. You know, it was ne not necessary to continue with uh, with that program. And uh, well, we have to keep an eye. That, um, we have to we have to be fully aware that we have very high inflation. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there is another leg eh, of the of uh, you know this situation that is growth. Hmm? Yeah. Let's move again to the situation regarding growth and inflation, and most obviously to the war in the Ukraine. We have some statements prepared, and we're wondering whether you go from strongly disagree to strongly agree, and then you have some time to nuance okay. the stance. Um, so firstly, the first statement is that the fallout from the, Ukraine, from the Russian invasion of Ukraine will be worldwide stagflation, in that it will noticeably reduce growth and raise inflation and high unemployment. Well, you so know, I'm first, moderately, first, uh, moderately in agreement, you know. Uh, what, what's the definition of uh, stagflation? Uh, that we're going to have negative growth, negative growth. Let's let's try to define, you know, yeah, yeah. stagflation, you know, in order to know what we are talking about. Negative growth 
plus very high inflation, inflation in the area of uh, six, seven, eight percent. Mm -hmm. Well, um, let me, well, you know, let me say how I see the situation. Well, in terms of inflation, I told you that over the next months, two, two three months, we expect that inflation will continue rising. Tomorrow we'll have the data on uh, the euro area. It's going to be higher in comparison with the, with the February data, with the February figure. And uh, I hope that the peak will be, uh, will be, will be reached in two, three months. And growth. I think that, uh, you know, the war, the war is having an impact on growth now in Europe. And, uh, well, we had a strong recovery prior to the war. Our projection of growth for 2022 was more than 4%. Uh, well, we have started to say that, uh, you know, this is not going to be the number, that uh, the war in Ukraine is affecting, uh, you know, our, our growth projection, uh, and mainly is going to affect growth projection in the first half of this year. My impression is that growth in the first quarter of this year, that is almost over, uh, will be a slightly positive. We will have very low growth. And uh, in the second quarter of the year, my impression is that growth will be hovering zero. But so the, with the statement, do you agree or disagree with that we will see stagflation? Well, you know, but uh, it depends on the definition of a stagflation, and it, de it depends as well, you know, in the time horizon that you are considering. Are we going to have negative growth in 2022? I don't think so. Yeah, you disagree. I disagree. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on that time horizon. But I think that uh, <laughs> growth is going to be much lower. And I am, what I am trying to stress and to underline and to underscore is that in the first half of the year, growth is going to be weak. Yeah. In the U.S., the yield curve of the 5 to 30 year yield ratio <laughs> inverted for the first time in uh, since 2006. So that doesn't say everything, of course, but it does say that uh, that U.S. market doesn't have that much confidence, maybe, in well, this growth. Well, I think that, uh, you know, this is like, uh, you know, the joke of the, of the stock market. I think that an inverted yield curve has uh, discounted, has advanced mm -hmm. eight of the last three recessions. In but the it's US. not the other way around. Um, so, uh, well, I think that, uh, you know, in the case of the U.S., uh, markets are discounting that uh, the Federal Reserve is going to hike rates. Mm -hmm. So that's why, you know, in the, in, the, in the short tenors of the yield curve, you have an important increase. This is going to produce a slowdown of growth, and it will de depress inflation in the medium term. And that's why, you know, in the, in the longer tenors of the yield curve, you have, uh, you have lower yields. Yeah. That's the interpretation of the market. It can be right, it can be wrong. Markets are not always right. Huh? This is no. that, uh, <laughs> you have A few to, great to examples of 2008. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And then the second statement is uh, targeting the Russian economy through a total ban on oil and gas imports carries a risk of recession in European economies. Do you agree or disagree? I think that, uh, you know, sanctions on Russia sh should be very tough. Uh, I can tell you here my personal view because from the ECB, you know, we do not have you know a point on that because mm -hmm. it's not our, it's not part of our mandate. No, I think that uh, you know the tougher the measures, the better, in my personal in my personal view. But you have to understand simultaneously that there are some countries that are highly dependent on imports of gas. So no? a total ban would have risk of recession. Yeah. Yes. But you don't think that's going to happen? A total ban, or do you? Well, uh, well, first of all, I hope that, uh, you know, the war will be rapidly over, mm -hmm. perhaps. Mm. Yeah, I hope so, too. And uh, because of the, of the, you know, the human cost of the, of the, of the, of the war, this is incredible, no? That this might happen, you know, now in our times, no? And uh, um, uh, I hope that, uh, well, situation will become more normal. And let me say something. No, I think that the world has changed since the invasion of Ukraine. In what sense? Well, you are very young, hmm? and so you don't remember. You have lived, uh, you know, the majority of your life after the fall of uh, the Berlin Wall and uh, the fall of the Iron Curtain and the collapse of the Soviet Union. That's not what's, that was not my case, no, because I am 62. You know, 50% of my time. Uh, you know, I had to, to, 
to, to live with uh, the Soviet Union and the other 50 percent without, without different, in a different situation. And I think that, uh, you know, we have taken advantage over the last 30 years since uh, the, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, we have taken uh, advantage of a sort of dividend of peace. Uh, well, here in Europe, we knew, we not, well, you know, before the Soviet Union was a threat for, for, for liberal Europe, uh, so the, the collapse of the Soviet Union was a positive uh, shock, huh? and we could uh, allocate our resources, our investments, to, uh, you know, to uh, some targets that had very little to do with, uh, you know, the conflict, the potential conflict. You know, this is the, fa the famous saying between, are you going to invest in guns or in butter? We were able to invest in butter. Hmm? Now, I think that the situation is going to change. Even, uh, hopefully, you know, I expect that, uh, you know, the conflict will be, will be addressed and, uh, you know, will we'll finalize. But I think that we have learned a lesson. And we know perfectly that if we want to defend, and I come back to the first, uh, you know, statement that I made at the beginning of my inter intervention, if we want to, to defend uh, liberal principles, uh, democratic uh, uh, values, uh, tolerance, all these kind of things, well, we will have to invest more in guns. So, the and it's going to have an impact on the on the economy. This is not uh, this is not trivial for the economy. No, because you have to hit NATO norms and even extend them, so that's percentage-wise, GDP is quite low. Well, you know, fiscal policy and, <laughs> uh, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, it's not the same to, to invest in guns or invest in butter. It's not the same at all, eh? No. Mm -hmm. In terms of productivity, in terms of uh, medium-term and long-term growth, potential growth of the economy. But I think that the, the, the world has changed. COVID had other, you know, has brought an additional, let's say, structural change. That is the question of the global supply chain. Now we know that, uh, you know, we have to, to, to look at, uh, you know, uh, uh, deliveries that are closer uh, to us, uh, that we cannot uh, trust so much on this kind of global uh, chain uh, yeah. and the supply of, uh, you know, from, you know, remote places. This is something that we have learned as well. Yeah, so this has an impact as well. In, on, on giant growth, right? meta giant changes to the European economy. And then we have a last statement, uh, might be a bit more fringe, is that the act of freezing Russian assets in the Eurozone will significantly lower demand from abroad for European assets. No, I no? disagree. Not even a small? No, I, I disagree. Disagree? I Strongly disagree. agree. Mm -hmm. Oh, disagree. <laughs> no, I disagree. I think that, uh, you know, uh, Russian assets are Russian assets. Hmm? And, uh, you know, I think that the freeze of Russian assets, mainly the, the freeze of the, of the reserves of the central bank is one of the most powerful measures that we have taken. And that is totally propor proportional, taking into consideration the kind of things that we have, been, we have seen Putin doing lately. Yeah. Okay, then we move away from the statements and we open the floor to the audience for audience questions. So if someone has an audience question, please raise your hand. Yes, person with the glasses there. Hello, so my question is regarding uh, the communication of policy. So I think as economists we broadly understand um, yeah, what the economic impact of our policies are. But I find that everyday people or people that just didn't study economics have absolutely no clue what it, anything that we say means. Uh, do you think the ECB should play a role in communicating to everyday people that don't really understand what we're talking about? And what impact do you think that would have on inflation? So this is a good question about communication. Well, central banks are central banks. Uh, you know, we, talk, we do not talk about football. We do not talk about uh, Netflix. We talk about what we talk. Uh, uh, monetary policy, financial issues, economics, these kind of things. And I think that uh, is, uh, is important that we have, let's say, communication with, uh, with economists, with market participants, uh, because expectations are very relevant in, 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 in life, in, mainly in markets. So there is a channel 
that has to be, you know, quite, let's say, technocratic, if you allow me to say. Mm -hmm. But simultaneously, our decisions are affecting, uh, you know, the life of the, of the Europeans, mm? not only the technocrats or the market participants. So it's important that simultaneously we start to explain them why we are taking decisions, why we have negative interest rates, why uh, well, we are normalizing our monetary policy, what is this going to imply in terms of the daily lives. For instance, if we normalize uh, policies, well, you have seen that nominal yields are on the rise and this will have an impact you know, on the, on, the, on the mortgage that they pay every month. These kind of things we have to try to, to communicate, to explain to them. Hmm? But, uh, well, uh, so it has to be, let's say, a two-handed approach. Um, on the one hand, uh, uh, you know, to, 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 to specialists, to markets, to market participants, to economists, to financial guys. And on the other hand, you know, we need to have, you know, a broader audience because we are a European institution and we are, you know, one of the pillars of the confidence on our common currency. That is the one that they have in their wallets. Thank you. Another audience question? Maybe that there in the back? Or, or maybe also a girl? You go for it. Yeah, you can have one. You mentioned um, higher sanctions to Russia. We do need to understand that when it comes to the sanctions, some of them are targeted to the government and some of them are targeted to the actual people. So how can we make a clear distinction and how can we make sure that the sanctions are targeted to the, people, to the, to the government rather than the people? To your opinion, what are some sanctions targeted directly to the government? So how can we increase the sanctions without influencing the people? Because we have to understand that behind the numbers, there are people. We know, we know perfectly. You have to bear in mind that, uh, you know, I am, I am a Spanish. Hmm? And one of the issues that uh, we have uh, dealt with in the, in the past is uh, sanctions from the US to Cuba. And how this was affecting people, no? And to distinguish between governments, between the establishment and the ordinary people. It's not always easy. It's not always easy. Uh, so uh, here, you know, well, uh, in the case of Russia, a lot of measures have been taken for oligarchs. Uh, the yachts of the oligarchs, <laughs> now, you know, they are, they are frozen, let's call it that way. Uh, Abramovic will have to dispose <laughs> uh, Chelsea Football Club. Hmm? <laughs> um, I don't know if you follow me, you know, these kind of things, uh, you know, are going to be targeted and as well to the establishment of the, of the Russian. Simultaneously, you have seen that, uh, you know, many companies are walking away. Uh, uh, so, uh, it's not easy, it's not easy to, 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 to distinguish. But simultaneously, simultaneously, well, I think that, uh, you know, if people start to be aware that uh, its government, his, her government, is not doing the right things. That will be, you know, um, that will be, you know, a helping hand in order to change the course of the actions of the governments in the future. But I understand, I understand perfectly your point that it's not always easy to distinguish, you know, the ones that you want to punish, those that are totally innocent. Hmm? Okay, we'll do another round of audience questions in the end of the interview, so uh, we'll have time for that. But now we'll also move on to uh, another uh, part, because right now we come from years of stimulating monetary policy, already starting before the pandemic, but even increased. Um, and that has saved the economy, yeah, at least during the COVID pandemic. Uh, but it also resulted in large amounts of uh, pandemic debt. And you know, the, we lived by the thought of spend, 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 that was the mandate, but how much of a risk is the debt that we have now for us? Well, uh, you know, I think that is one of the, legacy, uh, the legacies of the, of the, of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. In Europe, we are going to have uh, 20 percentage points of uh, higher public debt ratio. Hmm? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not, uh, and there is uh, heterogeneity. Eh? Mm -hmm. Not all the countries have increased, uh, you know, the same amount. Well, you know, uh, 
With respect to fiscal policy, what I have to say is that those countries that have uh, a weaker uh, fiscal profile, let's call it that way, will have to present in the future um, a fiscal consolidation program in order to guarantee fiscal sustainability over the medium term. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Uh, because, uh, well, fiscal sustainability continues being relevant and continues being relevant in a monetary, in a monetary, in a monetary union. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is one of the legacies. It's totally yeah. inevitable hmm, to have a higher yeah. public debt ratio because we had a big drop in GDP, in nominal GDP, and simultaneously we have to spend more. Uh, in that respect, uh, I think that the contribution of the ECB maintaining very low financial costs mm -hmm. is one of the factors that is making this uh, higher level of debt much more sustainable over time. Is it then also a factor why, for instance, the Bank of England already announced three rate hikes and the United States also probably gonna annou has announced rate hikes uh, because of this heterogeneous effect in the European uh, Union that you're a bit, l bit more lagging behind regarding rate hikes? No, I don't think so. I think that, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the US and you look, at, you look at the UK, the big difference with uh, the euro area is first, in the evolution and the dynamics of the labor market. And second, in the case of the US, inflation was much higher than in Europe. Hmm? And third, the fiscal, the fiscal program was much more, the fiscal stimuli in, in the US was, was much bigger, were much bigger than in the case of, uh, of Europe. In the case of US, they are in a different position of the business cycle. They have, uh, you know, a bigger problem of, uh, of, uh, of inflation. And they have started to see an important increase in wages. That is the mm -hmm. factor that I told you before that is going to be crucial in order to determine the evolution of the, of the, of the monetary policy. In the case of the UK, it's similar. It's similar in that, uh, in that respect. The unemployment rate is um, 4%. In Europe, we have, uh, we have very good news from the labor market. Eh? Now, I think that uh, yesterday or today, I have read that uh, you know, the unemployment rate is uh, below 7%, so uh, uh, the labor market uh, performance is quite, quite good. But we are not there so far. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we are in a different position than they are. Yeah. But and there is something, let me say something. <laughs> uh, to be the central bank of a monetary union, is much more difficult than being the central bank of, uh, of the UK or yeah. the US. Yeah, we're not saying you have an easy job. <laughs> no, but, um, but of course these debts are dependent on monetary policy. So if, hypothetically speaking, and it will probably happen somewhere in the future, uh, the policy normalizes again, it put, this puts a bigger pressure on, the pressure on the debts that countries have right now. Yes, uh, you are. You are and you are. how much are they at risk of not being able to refinance their or to service their debt? Well, but let me say, you know, I come from one of the usual aspects in mm -hmm. terms of the, <laughs> in terms of uh, you know, high debt countries. I come yeah. uh, I from Spain. Spain. And you're in the whole of the line <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> so, uh, no, no, I, I will try to be, you know, as neutral and as, as European as possible. If you allow me, if you allow me <laughs> to, to, to 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 say, you know, but I think that. Uh, well, uh, I think that, uh, you know, the high, high, high uh, debt countries will have to, to put in place a consolidation framework in the near future in order to guarantee the sustainability of public, of public finances. But let me say something now because, well, uh, you know, I remember that, uh, you know, when, when I, I arrived in Spain, you know, to the, to the Ministry of Finance in 2011, at the end of 2011, the situation was awful. The banks, uh, treasuries, uh, the, the, the situation of government bonds, the spreads, uh, a recession. We didn't have, you know, the, the helping hand of the ECB at the, as it was the case during the, the, the pandemic. And uh, I would not underestimate, you know, the effort made by, not only Spain, eh? I refer Portugal, Italy, um, Greece, well, Greece was a little bit different, but Greece made a whole lot of effort. So you'd say the well. north-south divide has lessened? Well, uh, I don't think so. I think that uh, Europe, Europe is polyedric. Uh, well, I think that uh, you know the real, the real, the real uh, wealth of Europe is that you have you know countries like Netherlands, like Germany, like uh, Belgium, like the Baltics. But afterwards, you have you know you have. Uh, 
uh, you know, uh, other countries with, uh, you know, different characteristics, but that make, you know, a very, a very, I would say, you know, uh, a very rich complex that makes us much stronger. But, you know, my point is that these countries, these uh, usual suspects, as yeah. you know, I refer to Spain, they made a, a wholehearted effort. Eh? And Spain, for instance, started to grow in 2013 quite a lot. And we outperformed the majority of the countries in the 2020. So, uh, in terms of competitiveness, uh, well, this you did a good job as minister. Of no, 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 no. <laughs> it was it was the effort. It was the effort of the Spanish population. Yeah. But as well, you know, the Greek population. Yeah. Um, but of course, then there was no war hmm? threatening economic growth at that time. There was no war. Well, or but uh, well, there was a war. Well, a war. I hope that it will be, you know. Uh, not very very common situation. I hope so. Uh, but uh, you know, times were not uh, were not easy. Eh? You know, remember that the great financial crisis. Uh, we had a lot of doubts with respect to banks. We had we had a lot of doubts with respect to the fiscal sustainability of the countries. We had some problems of competitiveness at the end of the day, and uh, you know, a common monetary policy, and uh, you know, a fiscal policy that was quite uh, tight uh, mm -hmm. uh, overall. Eh? So uh, I think that the effort of these countries uh, is something that we you cannot uh, you cannot overlook. Eh? No, I have a very personal curiosity of mine is that in central banking you have hawks and doves. You have people that act more actively <laughs> on inflation, <laughs> and you have people that those are the hawks, and the people that wait a bit are the doves. And what I'm wondering, did your perspectives change from being a minister in Spain compared to now the ECB? Well, Would you say you act more hawkish? You know, I have a very clear mandate now, you know, that is price stability. Now, but if you allow me, because I think that sometimes it, these kind of stereotypes are oversimplification of mm -hmm. the reality. There are 25 of us, you know, in the governing council. And uh, here now, you know, if you allow me to say the discussion, you know, I never, I never prejudge hmm, monetary policy actions that the governing council is going to take over the next months. But let me say something, you know, I think that now, you know, if you want me, if you want uh, if you want me to put the debate very clearly, the debate will be, now we have an increase in inflation. This increase in inflation is going to be, you know, it's, it's quite obvious, it's a reality, it's going to continue on the rise. Uh, so, this increase in inflation will produce, over time, uh, a deceleration of the economy. Now there is a deceleration of the economy. So this deceleration of the economy in the medium term will reduce automatically inflation. So you need to, to have you know, the whole perspective. Eh? So some people will say, no, we have to act rapidly because we have a hike, a very important increase in inflation. But are those people more than Northern? Like, is it still, still divided? No, 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 I would not simplify. I would not simplify that, no. Okay. Because uh, I think that you have, uh, you have uh, different views in that, uh, in that respect that do not coincide with the traditional divide between Which is Scotland good because you're supposed to act from a European-wide standpoint in the government. Yes, 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 but uh, I think that, the, you know, I think that both, uh, both uh, perspectives are correct one. Yeah. But if you want my opinion, if you want my opinion, I think that our mandate is price stability and we have to focus on price stability. Quite hawkish. <laughs> Do you think that this is hawkish? This is our mandate. Okay. And simultaneously, we have to take into consideration, you know, the consequences of, uh, you know, our actions. We have to look how uh, monetary policy and how inflation is going to converge in the medium term to uh, our, our price stability definition, that is 2%. Yeah. But I think that this is, this is shared by everybody. Hawks and doves. <laughs> All birds. <laughs> what does it even mean? It's the treaty. It's the treaty. Yeah, but you said you're, you have your mandate, but you're also still your own person, and you have been minister of Spain. So do you sometimes find these thoughts I conflicting? Conflicting? No, no, no. I think that, uh, you know, uh, price stability. Now the inflation rate in Spain is 10%. This is, you know, the biggest problem of the Spanish population now. So if we start, if we get to, 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 to subdue mm -hmm. inflation, that will be very good for Spain. Yeah. For Spain, for Italy, for, for Portugal, for, I do not want to, well, you know, I, I, I refer to Spain because of, well, you know, it's natural in my case. But I think that, uh, you know, now the main problem, huh, 
in terms of uh, you know the, the, the Spanish economies to have an inflation rate close to the percent. Okay. And if we talk about, um, for example, the Taltro 3 uh, fund scheme, that was a, a scheme of very cheap loans, bluntly put. Um, and for example, Italy received uh, nearly one fifth of the fund uh, in this uh, scheme, so or schedule. So I'm just wondering, have some banks or some um, countries become too dependent on ECB's funding? No, but I think that in the case of Delta III, well, you know, you have to bear in mind that the Italian economy, the weight of the Italian economy is something like 15, 16. So 20 in comparison to 15, 16, is not, uh, there is not a big gap, no, in that, uh, in that respect. I think that all the countries have taken advantage of the, you know, li liquidity delivered in very good conditions by the ECB through the Teltro, the Teltro programs. So you have it as well, you know, in the case of Germany, Spain, for instance, is below. Hmm? Mm -hmm. It's capital key, let's call it that way. Uh, but uh, in the case of Germany, in the case of Netherlands, Belgium, they have taken advantage. So I don't think uh, that, uh, you know, there is any sort of, let's say, domestic bias uh, in that respect. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, we've definitely taken advantage with the ratio of deposited funds against the ratio of, like, um, what countries got from the Taltro. That has been very heterogeneous. But there is something that is, uh, is important, you know, Teltro, the liquidity delivered uh, through the Teltro, the Teltro programs is a liquidity that you have to lend. Mm -hmm. The banks have to lend it hmm? eventually. If you don't lend it and you keep it in your balance sheet, then you don't have, you know, the, 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 the favorable financing conditions of Teltro. So we have seen that an important majority of this liquidity delivered through Teltro, at the end of the day, is having a, uh, you know, a positive impact in terms of lending. That was, uh, you know, the, the intention of the Teltro, the Teltro program. And the distribution by country, uh, I think that is, uh, I, I would say that is, uh, you know, more or less evenly distributed according to the weight of each one of the, of the countries. There are not uh, big gaps uh, in that respect. Hmm? Okay. Yeah, yeah and, um now, speaking of all these current uncertainties, we uh, almost forget that we also have a very big crisis awaiting us on the horizon, which is climate change. Um, and the central banks have also uh, made it a hot topic. So I'm wondering, what is, central what is the central bank going to do about climate change? Well, there are, you know, this is one of the issues that we have, uh, we have included in our study review. We have approved a sort of uh, climate change or environmental uh, uh, plan. Um, and there are, you know, there are several impacts. Well, first of all, the fight against climate change, uh, well, the main, uh, uh, let's say, institution responsible are the governments. That's yeah. something, you know, because you have taxation, incentives, uh, taxonomy, these kind of things. So let's put it that. But we as a central bank, we can make a contribution. Because, uh, you know, I believe that climate change is perhaps, you know, one of the main threats that we are going to, to, to confront over the next uh, 20, 30 years. Hmm? So, having said that, first of all, what we have to do is to take into consideration how climate change affects the outlook of the economy. Inflation and growth. Mm -hmm. Second, we have to take into consideration how it's going to affect financial stability because some banks have uh, bigger spec exposures to uh, climate change related risks than others. Third, we have our program of purchases. You know, in my case, I am, I am responsi responsible for the balance sheet, for the, you know, the, the risk management of the balance sheet of the, of the ECB. And uh, there is a part that we buy corporate bonds. So now we are incorporating more and more uh, uh, climate-related uh, uh, issues to the analysis of the solvency of the different issuers. So we are going to demand that if we buy a bond of a corporate, that we know perfectly that this corporate is not going to incur in climate uh, change uh, risks in the medium term that could affect its solvency. Hmm? So it's good in terms of solvency and it's good in terms of the fight against climate change. Hmm? 
So this is another element that we are taking that we're taking into consideration. No? So it's uh, something that we have we have there. It's not easy because uh, you know rating agencies they don't they have started to incorporate environmental considerations into the analysis and the rating of the different of the different corporates. But sometimes we have to do it on our own. No? But it seems uh, like the ECB was a bit like late, not late to the party, but between 2016 and 2019, you published five papers with climate change in the title, and from 2019 to now, it's more than 160. Well, so what, what, what changed all of a sudden? You well, being... I think that uh, <laughs> the change is, uh, you know, is the perception of the society. We, we do not, well, you know, we are central bankers. Hmm? And, uh, you know, but we do not live in an ivory, an ivory tower, let's call it that way. We have to be in contact with the, with the society. And uh, you know, with uh, you know the the, 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 the concerns and the preoccupations of the, of the of the society, and climate change is one of the preoccupations. So that's why we are paying much more attention to climate change. Now, 2016 was already the, the Paris Agreement was already there, so it was already going on. But well, we have gained momentum over time. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> so nothing's changed in the strategy of the ECB. Well, uh, you know, and, and I think that, for instance, you know, <clears throat> in that respect, the arrival of the president, the president. Uh, is uh, very, 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 very uh, sensitive to, to climate change issues, and she has a very clear, you know, focus on that. And I think that uh, that kind of guidance, uh, and as well, you know, for instance, you know, the Dutch uh, member of the of the board, Frank Alberson, is also, you know, paying out attention to that. One hundred percent of his speeches mention the word climate change. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, no? Yeah, it's good, definitely. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned uh, the role of central banks is partly to. Uh, reduce the risks of uh, climate-related shocks. But lately, there's also been a lot of debate on whether or not central banks should pursue some kind of asset purchases with a green strategy, for example, by buying green bonds or favoring issuers that commit to reducing emissions. That's one of the questions. Well, you know, I think that what you have to bear in mind, and I think that the important element, is that if uh, a corporate, a bank, mm -hmm has a big uh, climate change related risk in its balance sheet, then first of all, this is something that we have to take into consideration because it might impair the solvency of the corporate mm -hmm. in the future. And second, this is you know, fully aligned with uh, you know, the, the, the intention that we have to give a helping hand in order to fight climate change. Yeah. So you can, you can kill uh, two birds with one stone, you allow me to say. Yeah, so do you then also refer to tilting, what has been discussed, so the tilting of asset purchases to greener assets? Well, but we are doing that. Yeah. When, uh, you know, in the rating you are taking into consideration your climate uh, change related issues, yeah. you are tilted <laughs> in favor yeah. of the fight against climate change. And do you think that's possible without becoming politically involved? Because that's not... You should not be politically involved, of course, as a central bank. Well, we can, we can make a contribution. Now, you know, you have, uh, you know, one of the main policies of the European Union is the fight against climate change. So we can make our contribution. I said at the beginning, we are not the, the crucial actor of that, mm -hmm. but we have a role to play. Okay. Yeah, let's open up the space for audience questions again. Uh, Please keep them short and concise. Uh, to the yellow. To the left side. Oh, Martina, um, Martina over there. Oh. I will try to keep myself concise as well. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so undoubtedly, like economy and the economy and politics are usually kind of one affects the other, and in that context. Russia extending into Asian territory as well, but the European Central Bank kind of, from what I understand, taking a central role in the sanctions, wouldn't that also kind of have a domino effect on um, how whichever Asian countries that Russia also somehow supports, would they, from a political perspective, then economically react somehow, or would that, how would that affect them? Well, I understand perfectly your question, no, is that uh, if we are very tough, then Russia can start to, to look uh, to, other, to other places and not, not to be so much European, let's call it that way, no? But I think that, uh, you know, uh, the starting point is a cruel 
brutal invasion of an independent country. So when, when, when you start with that situation, I think that uh, you know, sanctions have, uh, to be, have to be tough. Uh, whether in the future, you know, that will imply that uh, Russia will, well, I don't know. But I think that in life, sometimes you have to react rapidly. You have to, re to react forcefully and to, to send a very clear message. And if you ask the Ukrainian people, for sure that they will ask for tougher measures against Russia. And I understand perfectly why. Uh, yeah, in the back there, you can ask a question too. First of all, thank you so much for the great discussion. Uh, my, I will try to make my question a bit quicker, but uh, basically in the past when we have seen uh, large expansions in the monetary base for big currencies, we see that the money really flows to the top. And these people are not the ones that are buying the bread, the milk in the consumer basket index. And now this time it's a bit different because we have really been giving money to the poor and the mo people that need it. How do you see it playing out differently now? Well, do you refer to delivering money uh, from, who? from the central bank? Yeah, but for sure also that, but just in general how we have seen that uh, really this money is going to the poor and the monetary base has been expanded very greatly. Uh, I think that uh, sometimes, mm. well, first of all, central banks, we are not almighty. Eh? <laughs> we cannot live in, uh, in uh, and sometimes I think that, you know, that, that kind of, uh, let's say, uh, distribution eh, of the money is much more, you know, the role of fiscal policy. With fiscal policy, you can increase, ta increase taxes, reduce taxes, uh, uh, set, uh, set up uh, grants, set up uh, uh, expenditures, favor, uh, well, education, the fight against climate change, uh, R&D, this, this kind of things. We have, you have to bear in mind that, uh, you know, we are, you know, monetary policy is a blunt instrument. We can uh, increase our purchases, we can raise interest rates, we can reduce interest rates. But afterwards, the distributional effects uh, are much more, you know, they, they have to be much more the attention and the objective of fiscal, fiscal policy. For sure that if we help the economy uh, to improve, then we are making a job in terms, but you cannot, uh, you know, distinguish between poor, rich, etc., etc. There is a very interesting debate, you know, about that, in the sense that uh, they have said that our monetary policy in the last years has favored the increase in the price of assets. And as these assets uh, are in the hands of the rich, at the end of the day, you know, we are favoring the rich. But let me say something. Uh, we have analyzed as well, you know, the consequences of our monetary policy actions. And, uh, you know, if you increase growth, if you create jobs, hmm, if you deliver price stability, at the end of the day, you are favoring, you know, the majority of the, of the, of the society. No? But I think that the question of uh, distributional effects uh, is much more, you know, it's much more, you know, an issue for, for fiscal policy and, you know, for governments, because, well, governments, for parliaments, you, you get a mandate in the election, and how, that's how, you know, the democratic system works, no? But it's much more, you know, an issue for fiscal policy. Okay. I'm so sorry, we don't have time for an extra audience question right now. Uh, so we'll go to our last question. Yeah, we'll slowly wrap it up. Um, you have four more years left in your uh, tenure at the European Central Bank. What do you still really want to achieve in the next four years? Well, <coughs> first of all, <coughs> sorry, I'm, I have started to lose my <laughs> My lawyers, in the last moment, no, this is not a question of your what. <laughs> <laughs> I need a little bit uh, something additional. Well, what I will tell you is that uh, if, you know, in four years, well, uh, we have uh, a better situation in terms of inflation, then we have met, uh, we have uh, fulfilled our mandate. Uh, if we have, uh, you know, uh, Europe growing at a rate of 2% over the next years is another indication that we are, going to, uh, we are doing our job 
properly, so low inflation and uh, higher growth. If we avoid a banking crisis, then it's another indication that we have made our job properly. And for your uh, job specifically? Mm -hmm. For you yourself? For myself, I think that financial, I am exactly. responsible for financial stability, I think that is important. But simultaneously, no, bear in mind something that I think that I come back to the first statement that I made here, no? Because sometimes we can talk about interest rates, about, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, I think that now, you know, the ECB is the, the, perhaps, you know, the most relevant European institution in the Euro area. Uh, because, well, we were able to put together, you know, the currencies of each country. And the currency is a sign of, uh, let's say, of, uh, you know, independence of each country. And we merged hmm, those, you know, legitimacies, national legitimacies into a European legitimacy. So, uh, if uh, the ECB uh, prevails, <coughs> then I can assure you that uh, it's not only about finances, it's not only about economics, it's about the future of, uh, of Europe. I think that's a beautiful <laughs> statement to end it on, the ECB, the future of Europe. Yeah, thank you so much for being with us. I thoroughly enjoyed it and I hope the audience did too. And even when you were not feeling optimally, yeah, I, I see that <laughs> you uh, saved it until the last uh, moment. Are you okay or do you need something? No, no, no. Okay, well, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you to the audience, too. Uh, it was a pleasure, and we have n another interview planned for next <coughs> week. Uh, it is with a mystery guest for the first time, because we can, for security reasons, not say who this guest is. But again, give some hints. Uh, it has to do with COVID. It has to do with a Dutch scientist. And uh, we will definitely talk a lot about it. So I hope to see you there. It will be on Wednesday. Um, and for now, I just want to thank you all for being here. And I would like a big warm applause for our guest, Luis de Guindos. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for you.